I'm converting a caboose into a shoving platform for modern switching operations on Ron's Trains and Things right now. Hi, I'm Ron of Ron's Trains and Things, and recently I was operating on some layouts that were set in an era when cabooses were still the norm on freight trains. And as I did, I was remembering my own childhood as I would watch freight trains pass through my hometown, wait for the caboose at the end of the train, wave at the conductor. It brought back a lot of nostalgia. Now, I model a very modern era, circa 2008, when cabooses were long gone. But one thing that did still exist on many railroads were shoving platforms that were converted from old cabooses used in certain types of switching situations. And so I decided that I would convert a caboose that I have on hand and make a switching platform that I actually needed for my layout and for my operations. Now, for this project, I did not follow a specific prototype. In fact, I'm fairly certain that the caboose that I'm using never existed on the road that I model, but it will serve the purpose nonetheless, and I think it would be an enjoyable project to do. Now, I intended for this to be a quick and simple project, but mistakes were made, and it turned into a much more complex project than I had intended. Now, in this video, I'm going to show you the mistakes that I made and how I corrected them, because that information may be helpful to you. So now, let's head on over to the workbench, and I'll show you how I converted this caboose into a switching platform. This video is brought to you by Midwest Model Railroad. Now with 15,000 square feet and one day shipping, they truly are your one-stop model railroad shop. MidwestModelRR.com, link in the description. Shoving platforms are pretty widely varied. The pictures I'm showing you here are not mine, they are borrowed from the internet. But what they show is that many shoving platforms are converted cambooses, though I have seen some that are made from old flat cars. They are used on long shoving moves where protection is needed, but the distance is too far for crew members to hang on to the ladders of the freight cars comfortably and safely. Typically, these cabooses have the windows plated over and the doors welded shut to keep vandals, vagrants, as well as crew members out of them. They are often marked on the sides with something like, shove platform only, do not occupy. They are sometimes equipped with whistles that operate off of the brake air to help signal the train's approach at grade crossings. I also understand that they sometimes include brake air gauges and a means to apply the train brakes. I've seen many people ask, why not just call them cabooses? The reason is that caboose refers to a car that is the office and home away from home for a conductor, complete with interior seating, sleeping quarters, office space, stove, and other amenities for comfort, safety, and functionality. A shoving platform requires none of these things and is simply a place for crew members to safely and comfortably stand to protect the train. I've seen former caboose shoving platforms that have been completely rebuilt and repainted like new equipment, and I've seen many others that look like they were given very little attention, just closed up and left to the elements. What I'm modeling today is more like the latter, a weathered old caboose that is functional but not pretty. I'm beginning with a Blueford Shops IC Half Bay Window Caboose, decorated for Penn Central. I chose this caboose because, well, I had it on hand from an old review video and needed to either use it or sell it. Step one was to disassemble the caboose. I removed the floor undercarriage and the roof from the body. Next, it felt natural to remove the window glazing as well. This was mistake number one. I realized partway through that the windows that were already blanked out on the caboose simply had the window glazing painted over. This model has window glazing that fits into the window openings and flushes up with the sides of the car. Shoving platforms often have their windows plated over from the outside, but sometimes they have them plated over from within, and sometimes they have windows that are plated within the window frames themselves. Simply painting the window glazing on this car would simulate that last option very well. Unfortunately, I didn't realize this until I had removed much of the window glazing, and it was glued into the models and thus difficult to remove. It was much harder to replace the window glazing than it was to take it out in the first place. Lesson learned, so I replaced all of the window glazing where I had removed it and moved forward. 
I masked around the steps and prepared the body and roof for painting. This is where I made mistake number two. I have simply painted over factory paint in the past and sometimes that works fine. In this case, however, it created a real problem. I painted the model Burlington Northern Cascade Green and the green covered the Penn Central teal color fine, but the ends of BN cabooses are yellow and the yellow paint simply would not cover the cascade green nor the teal, no matter how many coats I applied. So it was time to start over. I soaked the model in a small container of isopropyl alcohol for a couple of hours, then used an old toothbrush to remove the paint. The paint I had just applied came right off. The factory paint took a little more soaking and more vigorous brushing, but it came off without too much of a fight. When the paint was removed, I washed all of the parts in warm dish water and rinsed them with distilled water and let them dry. Now, with a fairly clean slate, I started again. I primed the model with Tamiya primer. I prefer a primer that I can airbrush, but this rattle can was all that I had on hand, so that's what I used. When using a rattle can like this, just take care to move quickly over the model and not apply too much paint especially over fine in-scale details. This time, I started with the yellow paint. I applied Vallejo Flat Yellow with my airbrush for the parts that needed yellow. I painted the end railings, roof ends, car ends, and porches, as well as the steps, this yellow color. It still required two coats to get good coverage. When the yellow had dried completely, I masked the ends in preparation for the green paint. I use automotive striping tape for detail painting as it allows virtually no bleed under and almost never removes the paint under it. I get mine from Amazon and I'll post a link to it in my Amazon pick of the week in the description down below this video. With the yellow masked, I applied a coat of polyscale Burlington Northern Green, also known as Cascade Green, to the body sides, roof, and the roof sides as well as the sills on the undercarriage section. Now, I know that polyscale is not available anymore, but there are other versions of Cascade Green that are available from other manufacturers. Again, you don't want to apply the paint too heavily so as to get runs, so two light coats is advisable, and that's what I did. Let me pause here to say that if you'd like to see more Model Railroad tips, tools, and techniques, be sure to subscribe down below and click that little bell icon so you can catch future videos. As soon as the green was dry to the touch, I carefully removed the masking tape. I was pleased with the paint job which required no touch up. I reassembled the undercarriage to the body at this point. Next, I applied a fade coat. For this, I used a light gray Vallejo paint. On a color wheel, you'll see that the complementary color to green, which is directly across on the wheel, is red. That means that a tiny hint of red will improve the fade coat, so I added a small drop of red to the light gray paint. I also mixed it thin and applied it lightly. Next, I needed to decal the model, but decals like a glossy surface, so I applied a coat of Vallejo acrylic gloss to the car sides. It's important to use an acrylic product here, as the solvent-based finish will soften with the products used on the decals. I completed this entire project with only items that I already had on hand, and I had some leftover decals from patching out BNSF locomotives, as well as some general freight car decals and some generic letters and numbers. At this point, I just wanted to apply the reporting marks, so I looked up some old Burlington Northern Caboose numbers to get a number in the right range. Then, using a straight razor blade on a piece of plate glass, I cut out BN number 18901 for both sides of the car. I also cut out lube plates for both sides. I soaked the decals in distilled water, then used micro scale micro set on the car side to help slide and set the decals into place. Micro set and micro saw tend to be confusing and I always get some argument as to which to use at what point but reading the instructions on the bottles clears up this confusion. Microset is the less aggressive of the two products and helps you to set the decal into place. 
Microsol is more of a solvent. It softens decals more and helps them to conform to the details. Always place a decal using Microset. Then, at the last step, coat it with Microsol and do not touch it again until it dries completely. The Microset and Microsol combined are absolute must-have products when applying decals, and I have a link to them with a non-spill holder in my Amazon Pick of the Week in the description as well. You'll want to check those out. I teased the numbers and letters into place with a toothpick, then used a round makeup sponge to remove excess moisture. When I was pleased with the placement of all the characters, I applied some Microsol and left it to dry. I placed the lube plate decal in the same way. I then repeated this entire process on the other side of the model. My second lube plate decal tore as I was placing it, but I simply positioned it so that the tear didn't show, and without extreme magnification, you'll never know. At this point, I painted the handrails per prototype photos using Vallejo off-white paint and a microbrush. When the decals had fully set and the handrails dried, I applied a coat of Model Master's Flat Clear to seal the decals for the application of weathering. When the flat finish had dried, I weathered the ends of the car with streaking grime from Ammo by MIG. I applied a liberal coat of the enamel wash then brushed it down to a streaking effect with a soft brush dampened with terpenoid. This is the only application of weathering the ends will get. Again, my goal is a fairly grimy, weathered appearance. I applied the same treatment to the end rails, the brake wheel and stand, and the steps. When that had dried, I reassembled the roof. I struggled throughout this process with the end rails as they were attached to the roof. Some of them broke away and had to be glued back into place, and all of them seemed to bow and bend as I reassembled the car. This was a real source of frustration. Next, I weathered the car's sides as I had the ends. This is just the first of two applications of weathering that the car sides would get. This layer was intended to just leave some light streaking and grime behind. When that coat of weathering had dried, I applied another layer of gloss finish in preparation for more decals. I had some early style BNSF decals to apply below the bay windows, as well as some green patches to put under them. I considered applying another patch to each side, and on top of that putting lettering that read shove platform only, but the lettering was so small that it proved nearly impossible for me to get it straight enough to look good, so I decided against it. I later found this decal set from Circus City Decals on eBay, which were exactly what I needed. I've ordered this set, but have not yet received it. I plan to apply the decal that reads, Shove Platform Only, Do Not Occupy, to this model over the green patch when I receive them. I plan to modify another, different style of caboose into another shove platform using this set of decals. These decals are available on eBay in both N and HO scale, so give them a search if you're looking to build your own shoving platform. One of my greatest frustrations in this project was the green patches. Every one of them that I used tore. I managed to place them in a way to hide the tears, but it was very frustrating. With a patch in place, I applied the BNSF decal over the top. I really liked the way these came out, looking like a true patch job caboose. When the decals had completely set, I applied another layer of acrylic flat to seal them and to prep for the final weathering coat. When that had dried, I weathered the roof with artist oils using raw sienna and burnt umber. I applied the raw sienna first being the lighter in color and looking like newer rust. I applied the oils with a makeup sponge with bits torn from the end of it to give it an uneven texture. After applying some of the oil paint, I then used the wedge barely dampened in terpenoid to remove the excess paint. I then did the same with the darker burnt umber paint. I continued to apply paint, then remove some, alternating the two colors, until I had the look of a rusty, grimy roof, but still had some of the green showing through. Oil paint takes a very long time to dry, but I helped it along with a hair dryer set on medium heat. 
This takes hours and maybe even days off of the drying time. Next, I applied another layer of MIG Ammo Streaking Grime to the sides. I did so exactly as I had before, applying it liberally, then removing and streaking it with a soft brush and turpenoid. Grimy and streaky was the goal. I again hurried the drying process with a hair dryer. After everything had dried for a day, I applied one last coat of acrylic flat and reassembled the couplers and trucks. I didn't film weathering the trucks and wheels, but I simply applied a rusty brown paint to the face of the wheels and sprayed the truck sides with Rust-Oleum Camo Dark Brown and then applied a bit of raw sienna oil paint. This is one of the primary areas where I need a shoving platform for switching moves from north yard to downtown yard on my layout. It allows crew members to protect the long shove move where there is no runaround track. I had fun converting this shoving platform and I will get a lot of use out of it on my layout. I also learned a lot that I plan to employ when building a second shoving platform that I need for the use at the other end of North Yard. A shoving platform adds some fun play value to a modern switching operation and it is satisfying to those of us who miss cabooses on our modern layouts. I really look forward to its use on my layout. Now I've made a number of videos about a wide variety of weathering techniques for locomotives, rolling stock, and structures, and you can find those and other Model Railroad content in the links on your screen right now. And be sure and join me on Tuesdays as I bring you even more great Model Railroad videos, and I look forward to seeing you then. Tim, Lizzie?